So hi, everyone. I'm Avni. I'm the founder of Genshi, and I'll be the moderator today. Super excited to get all your engineering questions answered. We have absolutely incredible engineers from Google and BetterHelp, and we have Julia, BetterHelp's lead talent uh, recruiter as well, to bring in insight um, so we can get, you know, hear more about the background of, you know, what it's like to actually break into software engineering. But more importantly, how do you actually land a job? How do you actually navigate this competitive job market right now? And I would definitely encourage everyone to use the chat as freely as they need, chat with each other and make sure to, you know, drop your questions there as well. And if I will try to get to as many questions as possible, we'll probably do more of um, a panel style from the first 30, 40 minutes. And then at the end, we'll save 20 minutes for questions that you guys can ask. I tried to keep most of the panel questions that you guys all submitted so that it's um, directly answering all the things you're thinking about, but obviously I'm sure I, I missed some. So hopefully we have time at the end for that. So yeah, um, before we dive into it, um, would love for each panelist to briefly introduce themselves, their current role and describe their journey into the world of software engineering or in Julia's case, the world of recruiting software engineers. So feel free for one of you to just jump and get started. I can jump in. I'm Amy Bowers. I'm a staff, full stack engineer at BetterHelp. Um, I've been with BetterHelp six and a half years. And um, actually the way I got into programming in college, I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I took a, I guess an aptitude test where I just answered a bunch of questions. How interested are you in this or in that? And then they matched my answers with thousands of professionals who are all happy in their jobs. And I got like a 99% match with computer programmers. Um, and that kind of set my course and it's been a good choice for me. I'll pass it on to Gigi. Hi, I'm Gigi Bloom Campo. I'm a software engineer at Google. I work on podcast and YouTube music. Um, I've been at Google for about six years and I had sort of an unconventional path to tech. I studied, I think my major was officially Chinese in college. And then I moved to Hong Kong after graduation and dabbled in academia and then moved back to New York City and started working in book publishing. And that was my real sort of first career. So I was in book publishing, working on cookbooks for about five years and had no CS training or education in any way before that, but decided I wanted to change and happened to see a friend who went through a programming boot camp, boot camp around the same time and it went well for her. Um, so I gave it a shot. So I went to App Academy in 2016 and that was my foray into tech. Um, yeah, here I am. So um, I'm the recruiter, I'm Julia Rosenberg and I had um, quite a few careers uh, before this one, including being a, a math teacher and uh, when I was in education, I took a research job researching in education. And from there, I took a job with another company that did market research for high tech enterprise clients. And so I would take a deep dive into um, all of the different technical projects. And I recruited all of the participants um, for these research studies. Uh, a lot of them were for things that you know. Um, we did the research study um, on Azure. Uh, talking to developers on how to develop Azure. We did um, uh, one on when Microsoft um, acquired Skype. So we did one on video conferencing. So anything it was really interesting work. Uh, and I got to work with a lot of different uh, types of technical people, loved it, decided uh, recruiting was my thing. So I spent 10 years doing that. About two and a half years ago, I moved over to BetterHelp as their first technical recruiter. So I recruit for uh, engineering. So all the devs, security, DevOps, um, test, QA and test, uh, data science and analytics, IT, anything uh, technical is uh, in my purview. And I'm also leading the, the team for uh, uh, talent acquisition across the entire company. So that's me. Perfect. Um, well, to kick things off, I just going to dive right into all the things that people have been curious about, which is how to stand out as an applicant. Um, Julia, do you want to just kickstart and share insights on how to break through that initial barrier to secure your first role or internship, um, as well as selecting meaningful projects and building a strong resume, particularly from the perspective of, you know, a recruiter who's actually hiring? 
Sure. Um, so I think uh, one of the first things that you can do to secure your first role is uh, network, network, network. Go through if your school or academy has sort of a job placement program or an office, uh, do take advantage of those. They really help a lot. Um, I have a partnership with App Academy, um, Yaron and I uh, communicate a lot. When we have an opening, I let her know so that the App Academy grads um, at least have an opportunity to get their applications in. Uh, I think if you're having a really hard time finding an internship or your first role, especially if you're a new graduate, uh, do some projects on your own. See if you can't find, um, you know, maybe a volunteer organization who's, you can build an app for them or uh, build a website for a nonprofit. Anything that you can do to get something on your resume and make sure that you include the tech stack that you're working with for each project that you're doing. And I think the boot camps do a really good job of helping you put your resume together and including the tech stack for each of the projects that you do. Um, it's very helpful for a technical recruiter uh, to see those, um, those tools because it doesn't have to be an exact match for my particular company, but it gives me an idea of the kinds of things you've been working with and, you're, and how comfortable you are with particular tools. So that's really helpful too. Um, I think the big, the list at the top with all of your skills is good, but make sure that you include them with each of the projects, each of the roles that you've had um, uh, that you're listing on your resume. The other thing I would say in standing out as an applicant, um, when I put application questions at the bottom of the application, please answer them. I get a lot of, of um, uh, applications where it says, see resume. And honestly, every resume has a different format. Um, some of them don't even upload properly. And so I put the questions at the bottom so that I have the information that I need. And I only have 10 seconds per application. They come in, I get so many of them. I put in, um, a, a, I'll open a role and I'll get 2,500 applications in 24 hours. So it's a lot to go through. So make sure that you answer those application questions uh, because the ones, the people who write C resume or NA, or they just put a one, 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 and they go down through, I, I just um, disqualify them because I don't have time to go back and take a look. And it tells me that maybe they're not so serious about the role. Um, and I think the other thing that you can do that would be really helpful would be to um, ignore the cover letter. Don't don't write a long cover letter. And, and please do not copy paste the cop the cover letter from something that you see on the internet. Um, that is not helpful. And we don't have time to read them. But if I see something like that, I wonder, ooh, is this person is this person lazy? Do they not have good writing skills? Why are they doing this? So uh, that is that's a mistake. So please don't don't copy paste something that you see on on the internet. Um, Avni, am I answering this question properly? Is there anything else I should be adding? You're answering it perfectly. And I'm honestly so surprised to hear, see that so many people actually do copy paste on the internet and you can also tell. Oh yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Just two or three sentences. Um, I'm really interested in better help because uh, I got into engineering because uh, just one or two little sentences, that's it. That's all That's all you need. Yeah, keeping it brief, but making it intentional and actually about the job you're applying for is really important. Exactly. I actually had, I just hired someone who's was, and I don't really usually take the time to read these cover letters. And he made a connection between David Bowie and software engineering. And it was so interesting to me, I had to read it. So um, yeah, if, if anything that you can do uh, that way is helpful. And I do, I love hearing about people who have different careers. So um, how, you, how you made the transition from accounting to software engineering or music to software or publishing to software engineering. Um, it's just, it's very interesting to me. So anyway, I think I've probably said enough. I'm, I'll let, pass it back over to you. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Own your story. I think that's really important. Don't be afraid of the fact that you are a career transitioner or you're coming from a different background. I think that there is a way to spin that story to make your, you know, unique things actually your advantage as a software engineer and someone who can stand out amongst everyone else who's had more traditional backgrounds, I think is pretty interesting point. Um, Amy and Gigi would love to hear uh, how you guys landed your first role and, you know, what really helped with that. 
uh, so uh, I do have a, a story, but I was a little bit sneaky. I was so desperate. I've been looking for work for a long time. And um, I finally, so what I did was I called up Blue Cross, which is a huge company. You know, we all know how big that is. And I managed to get through to somebody who could direct my call. And I said, I'm doing a college paper on programming in business and need to talk to a manager. And she was really helpful. She gave me a choice of like three departments. I randomly chose one. As soon as she connected me to this uh, manager, I switched. I just said, I'm looking for a job. And he had a position open. Um, so I'm not recommending that specifically. It was an end run around HR. Sorry, Julia, apologies to you. <laughs> um, but it worked for me. So, you know, just think outside the box of other ways you can connect. Maybe, Gigi, do you have a story? Amy, that story is incredible. <laughs> um, so for me, when I graduated from my boot camp, it was tough going, trying to find a job. There were a lot of other boot camp graduates out there. Um, and I had no formal programming experience and I was looking for a job as a programmer. So my best advice from that time was just to get into a system of a lot of job applications. Um, I would crank out five a day in the morning and then in the afternoons, I would do practice interviews and work on side projects. Um, and I also, as Julia said, I tried to network as much as possible. Um, and any sort of community that I was a part of that had its own way to job hunt, um, I pursued as much as I could. And I ended up finding my first uh, developer job was at a small startup. And I found it through a women in tech job board, um, which was great. And <clears throat> oh, and one thing I wanted to mention was um, I realized during that time that I needed to not like look for my dream job right out the gate because I probably wasn't going to get it. So I, was, I wouldn't even be interviewed for it. Um, and so I really just looked for, for a job and I tried to be flexible on all of my wish list items in a job. So I ended up moving. I was living in New York at the time um, when I attended App, App Academy and I ended up moving to Boston for my first tech job. Um, yeah, what else? I took some notes ahead of this. Be flexible. Don't look for your dream job right out the gate. Five applications per day. Oh, and for practice interviews, for um, mock coding interviews, there's a website called pramp.com, P-R-A-M-P.com, where you get paired with another human and you do coding interviews to each other. And you're provided the interview problem and a solution that you're supposed to guide the other person towards. And I must have done a hundred of those when I was job hunting. Um, and then also when I was preparing to interview at Google. So that I think was like the most useful, free available external tool for job hunt that I came across. Yeah, I really love what you said. Don't focus on your first job being your dream job. Like no one says th things just come automatically and for free the first time you try. Like you have to build up to something great. And it's obvious that there really is no shortcut, especially for this first phase of your career. Like you mentioned, you were doing all these interview preps and just spending an entire day networking, practicing. Like that's real. And there's no way to skip that. I think people really feel like they're alone in that journey. Oh my God, I'm spending the entire day practicing. I'm spending the entire day networking with a hundred people and it's not getting anywhere. Well, that's kind of almost like a rite of passage I feel when you're early in your career. I mean, I can say that I did the exact same thing, which is like interview, practice interviewing all day. Then I would do like five interviews and I would talk to 50 people and then I would get like a hundred rejections. I was like, okay, start over. We try next week, right? Um, the job market right now and the current economic climate is obviously pretty tough. Um, we can all agree there, there's there's no question about that. Any unconventional approaches to job hunting or any tips you have for standing out right now, specifically as it's super competitive right now? And question is for anyone to answer. I, I actually think um, that that the approach of doing some in the morning and some in the afternoon is a good one. Because as the recruiter who's getting so many applicants, um, these jobs are posted for a very short period of time. 
And as much as I would love to keep them open for longer and widen that candidate pool and give everyone the opportunity, I simply can't get through all of the applications. So I think I think that's a great piece of advice from Gigi is is you know doing some in the morning and some in the afternoon, and it it, it is uh, a a numbers game. Um, the more the more you put yourself out there, the bit, the higher the chance of you uh, connecting with someone and and getting an interview. I also love the interview practice. Um, I'm a big fan of the informational interview, uh, just to learn about more uh, more companies, more more roles. Um, how how does each company organize their their work? Um, how are the teams organized? Just the informational interview, I think, is really helpful, and it can give you a little more to say in the next interview and when it's a real interview. So you'll have better questions to ask if you've done some of these informational interviews as practice interviews. So, um, yeah, I think I think those are the I really like I like Gigi's answer to that. I would also add expect to get rejected. Like, I know it's crushing to get the rejection, but you're going to get rejected. And if you can look at it as it's one step, I have to go through this many rejections before I get a job and say, well, that's one step closer. And you learn each time. Yeah, literally the numbers game. So real. Um, I, I also want to touch upon you know, people coming from non-technical backgrounds specifically if they're thinking about transitioning into software engineering. Is there a certain background that you think it's easier to transition into software engineering? Um, is there an advantage to doing software engineering up front? Is it really just an equal game as long as you're practicing for those interviews and you're really like showing up and doing the work? Would love to know all of your perspective on this. I think it's like very much of a heavily debated topic of you know what's the right path to come from and um, our career transitioner is valid. I don't know if it's about the path. Gigi, you go ahead. I was just going to say, um, at Google now, there are, among my teammates, um, there are plenty of people who studied CS in undergrad, possibly got master's in computer science. And there's also plenty of people who have fairly untraditional backgrounds. Um, at my App Academy boot camp in 2016, people were from every kind of background, every kind of industry. Some people had studied computer science in either high school or college and then not done any, anything with it since. Some people like me had never, ever, ever done any coding until the prep work for that boot camp. Um, and it seems to me like a field that anyone can be successful in. You don't have to have formal training. Um, you can learn it. <laughs> I would agree with that. I think I think again, it's not how you got there, it's that you got there and you wanna be there. That's what I look for. People who are, um, who in, really enjoy coding, who are passionate about um, wh whatever it is, whether it's the company mission or the just the joy of building something and, and deploying it. Those are the things that I look for when I talk to candidates. Um, it, candidates who say, well, I changed careers uh, because I I lost my job and I didn't know what else to do. And I had a bunch of friends who were software engineers and they were making good money. So I went to a coding boot camp. Oh, don't say that. That's not, that's not a good reason for this career. Uh, I mean, it might be a reason, <laughs> but, but that's a little scary for a recruiter to hear. So make sure that you are truly enjoying your work. We want people who really are passionate about their, about their jobs. And so I would say if you're looking to transition, boot camps are a great way. A lot of the universities now have um, certifications as well, even in cybersecurity and, and other technical uh, um, fields. So I think those are wonderful. And the fact that I, we also at BetterHelp, we have people who've gone to boot camps. We have people who went to highly selective universities. We have people who are completely self-taught. Uh, there are a lot of different ways to get there. And if you're really, really interested and you want to learn, then just demonstrate that you want to learn. And whether it's a boot camp or certification or just taking whatever classes, LinkedIn learning, whatever you can find, um, those are good things. I will say, the coding boot camps are a great way to go because I think they do a wonderful job of preparing candidates and they learn a lot in those intensive. I think it, 
want to say it's they, some of them are 12 weeks or better. They're really intense and they're, they're great. So my two cents. Actually, um, Avni, I'm going to switch it back to you because I saw some questions in the, the chat where people were saying, how do people feel about the cost of boot camp versus, um, you know, going another direction? Do you have? Yeah, no, I think let's transition to that. It's a really good question. Like, let's talk about are there specific courses and programs, boot camps that we should be doing? How should we think about the costs of these? Are they worth it? Like, would love to jump into a conversation about that. I don't know what the cost is, the cost differential is between a boot camp and a four-year university. And I think it's going to depend on the four-year university or the, you know, the JC or whatever it is. Uh, I, I would be interesting to see a comparison. I, I don't know, Amy, do you, do you notice a difference in the engineering skill level of someone who's gone to university or someone who's gone to a boot camp at the same number of years of experience? I'd I'd say if I mean I think a boot camp is going to be less cost less than a four year university, and it's like all coding, it's all fresh in your mind. So we've gotten I think everyone we've talked to from boot camps have been um, have had great skill sets. So if I had a kid who was starting in college now, I'd say if you think you like programming, consider a boot camp. You know if you can afford it. I know boot camps aren't free either. Mm -hmm. Julia, as a recruiter, do you feel like you pref prefer people with university degrees or you're open, equally open to boot camps and um, for your degrees? I actually kind of prefer the boot camps myself. Um, I love to see the career changers uh, as applicants because I think they really provide a, a rich perspective uh, and they they enrich the culture of the team and they provide um, it's interesting. You never know how someone's background is going to influence the conversation around development. We have uh, a, a full stack developer who came from a marketing background and he got into coding that way and it was all in marketing and uh, he did a lot of work in data analytics and he's been tremendously helpful in influencing uh, so the direction of some of the features of uh, at BetterHelp. So you just never know. I actually really like to see the boot camp background, uh, for, particularly for our more entry level roles. Senior roles are a different thing, and at that point, it doesn't matter whether they went to a boot camp or whether they have a university degree. At that point, it's more about what experience they have. So I hope that helps. That's super helpful, Gigi. I mean, you also went to a boot camp, so would love to hear directly from you what that experience was like. Um, do you mean the experience of sort of figuring out what the price comparison should be or more about like how to pitch myself as a career? Yeah, and how did you go about choosing and make, choosing a boot camp and making the decision to pursue a boot camp? And also in the process of recruiting, did you find any backlash on the fact that you came from a boot camp versus a traditional background? So for choosing a boot camp, um, I'm going to riff off of something Julia said about being passionate about programming. Uh, I would not say I was passionate about programming at the point when I decided to do a boot camp. Mostly I was born, burned out in my previous career, needed to change, wanted to move away from the city I was in. Um, and I thought at the time that being passionate about programming meant being somebody who did a lot of programming in their spare time. Um, for example, my husband is a programmer and he is one of those people who as a child built a computer from scratch. He just thought it would be interesting and he did this. And I looked at him and I was like, yes, he has passion for computer science. He like, that is what it looks like to be passionate about this. I don't have that, but maybe I can fake it. Um, and since I started working in tech, I also, I had a lot of imposter syndrome coming into tech because I just assumed that everyone in tech was also like that, was the kind of person who like would build a computer in their spare time and spent all of their free time coding side projects. And I don't know, I, I had all these images in my head of what it looked like to be a passionate programmer and all the ways that I wasn't that. And so frankly, I was just racked with imposter syndrome for the whole time of my boot camp. 
and several years thereafter and i'm like kind of coming out of it now and i'm almost you know eight years into my career as a programmer at this point um but i think what it looks like for me is more like i find my work very satisfying i find the product that i work on really interesting i use the product that i work on which is youtube music um i have been on a team at google where i didn't find the product personally inspiring and i really felt like i had a hard time progressing career-wise like i was doing good work my manager liked me everything was going well but i just sort of felt like i am not interested enough in this product to retain the details that i will need to retain in order to make significant advancements in my career here so that was part of my decision to move to youtube music um so that is a very long-winded answer of saying if you're wondering if you're not passionate about computer science you might be it just might look different from sort of the cookie cutter um person who builds computers in their spare time aka my husband um and on the topic of the price of boot camps at the time when i did my boot camp i don't know if this is still a thing app academy offered a tuition model where you could either pay a flat rate up front or you could pay 18 percent of your first year's salary once you got a job so that's what i did um and I was in a position of privilege in that I was able to take 12 weeks to go to the boot camp and be unemployed during that time because I had no income during that time. So I recognize that's not a position that a lot of people are in. And that was very lucky for me. Um, I do know that some boot camps provide a way to do things online and do it part time so you can continue to hold down a job and have a salary um, while also studying in the boot camp so that could be a more affordable way to go um i do think a boot camp is cheaper than a four-year degree but i'm not sure that's necessarily the comparison that a lot of people are making when they're considering a boot camp so that was quite a jumble there you go <laughs> no that was an amazing am answer and i think you're right like passion for a job and for a field looks very different to people um and it's not necessarily that you have to like dream about it or like build computers in your spare time to be an engineer and to actually enjoy and find fulfillment in that career. And oftentimes I think we think that we have to be like obsessed with their jobs and obsessed with our careers in order to be good enough for it. But I, I think it's, it's that that's oversimplification of like what this process actually is like to find a job you like and find a job that you can excel at. So I really appreciate you talking about your, you know, your story a little bit more. Cool. Well, I want to jump into potentially talk about specific examples of projects um, you can maybe suggest people work on, especially if they haven't had the traditional software engineering internships to put as experience on their resume. Um, how can is there like resources or inspirational guidance or tools of where people can find what types of projects to build? Is there a specific, specifically Julia, like is there a specific type of project you're looking for or like something from a project you're looking for when you're recruiting for a role and and Amy and Gigi if, if you're any project you did in your past to get a job would love to hear about that as well so if, I'm going to I'm going to approach this from the perspective of better help because we're a mental health care company we have a lot of helpers at better help the mission is very important to us and so I'm looking for people who if they haven't had an internship that maybe they've done something that is in um maybe they've done a project for the, the boys and girls club, or they've done a project for a local school or something where it's a volunteer organization that is uh, helping other people. Uh, but that's from better help. So for me, uh, those are the things that, that I'm looking for in terms of projects, but I've also uh, definitely spoken with folks about um uh, mobile apps that they've built and they've put on on uh, the store. You know, it's just interesting to see some people have have written really interesting things that they've got a little a little side business going. I love to see that. That's kind of fun. Uh, and to your point, though, I want to back up on the whole passion thing. My advice wasn't so much that you need to be passionate about coding all the time. You don't. But this is a little interview tip. Please don't tell the recruiter the only reason you went to boot camp is because you needed to make more money. That's not a good thing to say. Even if it's true, don't say it. 
So I just want to be really clear on that. I'm not expecting everyone to be building computers in their spare time like Gigi's husband, okay? <laughs> I want to make sure that, that that's not a, um, a thing that people are thinking. So anyway, back to the to the projects. Those are the, the, those are the kinds of things that I see on applications that sort of catch that sort of catch my eye if someone maybe someone has a real interest in cooking back to Gigi's cookbooks uh, maybe they've written an app for a recipe finder or something like that because they like cooking just anything that they have done that shows that they can build an app a website etc uh, works for me so I think that's enough from the recruiter let's talk to the actual engineers who have something to say about that <laughs> Um, when I was job hunting and for a lot of my app academy cohort mates who were uh, job hunting at the same time as me, all of us just found it easier to work on a side project if it was something we were ourselves interested in. So at the time I was two months out from my wedding and so I built my wedding website um, and I made sure that it, you know, used a Rails backend so that I could talk about how the backend was configured and that it also had some sort of reactive front end component so I could talk about how I had done that. Um, and I ended up even for one for the job that I ended up taking my first developer job after App Academy. Um, the interview was a pair programming exercise during which we built the RSVP RSVP feature into my website for my wedding. Um, so I think if you're looking for something to build something with a back end something with your active front end is good um if there are specific technologies that you want to learn then try to incorporate those um but yeah my top bit of advice would be make it something that you're interested in, and make it and make it something that you're excited to work on and where you have ideas for what the features should be because uh, then you'll just want to work on it and it'll be more fun Amy, did you have something to add? No, I, I think they've covered it covered it well. Awesome. awesome. Well, well, thank you for sharing those stories. Um, would love to dive into talking about DEI, specifically DEI at Google and BetterL. You can share a little bit more about what the company is doing for that. And um, also wanted to chat a little bit about sponsorships. Maybe Julia, you had some insight for people who do need work visas and do need sponsorships. How should they navigate that process? So uh, first of all, BetterHelp is um, pretty small. We only have 250 uh, employees, but we are part of Teladoc. Uh, we are a Teladoc company. They're very large. They have 5,000 employees. So for us, in terms of DE&I initiatives, um, we're too small to have anything really formal. Uh, but in, I do try to provide diverse pipelines for all of my hiring managers and all of my roles. I will say when I first came to BetterHelp, we had 14% women uh, in our technical roles, and we are now up to one third uh, women in our technical roles across the company. And uh, we have women um, on every single technical team at BetterHelp, with the exception of DevOps. If any of you know a DevOps engineer, a female DevOps engineer, send them my way. They're as rare as hen's teeth. I'll take one. Um, but we do we do try to prov provide really diverse pipelines uh, for the hiring managers and uh, love to provide those opportunities. For sponsorship, I would say because we're part of Teladoc, this is the beauty of being part of Teladoc. They have an immigration team and it's lovely. The one thing that I would say is be honest and upfront at the beginning that you need whatever your visa status is. Um, I'm on an OPT, I have an H-1B, what, whatever it is, we can get started early. We do have an immigration team, but we need to know in advance so that we can get started on it and understand how to, how to navigate it. I will say that the immigration uh, laws in the United States are quite complicated. And it's not something I would want to try to tackle on my own. So I'm very thankful for the immigration team um, at, at Teladoc assisting us at BetterHelp. So that would be my advice on the on the visas. I don't know, maybe Gigi, do you do you have something to add from a Google perspective? Unfortunately, I have very little visibility into what we do um, in recruiting. So I'm afraid I don't know the details of what Google does. 
No, I think that was really helpful, Julia. I think that does give insight. I think a lot of in international people who want visas feel like they can't get a job right now because visas don't exist for them. But it's it's awesome to know that you know companies like yours they are thinking about it and, and it's about really being honest and upfront about it in the beginning, so they make sure they're you know approaching the process the right way. Um, would love to just dive into hearing more of what it's like to be a woman in tech, some challenges that you've had some key factors in achieving a success. Let's talk pros, cons, all of it, because I do think it's it's more nuanced um, than a lot of the stuff that we talk about. GG, Amy. Uh, well, I would kind of jumping off of what Gigi said earlier about the imposter syndrome. It's really easy to feel like an imposter because media, you just, you hear everywhere is the impression that computer programmers are white men and it's easy to start feeling like I don't belong. And then also when, if your team is mostly men and, you know, maybe you're not interested in the conversations <clears throat> that go on amongst them, it's, it's easy to feel alienated again, like, Oh, I don't belong. Um, and for that, I would just say, <clears throat> sorry, keep, you know, make connections with other you know, people who feel similar to you. And um, if it's coworkers or people that you went through boot camp with, um, and then also connect with, like I've definitely sat at a lunch table with a bunch of men talking about how fast cars go from zero to 60, which does not interest me, but you know, I found something to, it's a micro connection. And then when later you collaborate on a project, you kind of know each other better, but just circling back to the beginning of it's try to recognize the feeling. If you start to feel like, oh, I don't belong and remind yourself you do belong. Gigi, do you have yeah, I think I think a lot of people in tech, I'm sure a lot of people in many industries, but in tech is where I hear about it the most, suffer from imposter syndrome. Um, I, when I joined my first developer job and then also when I first joined Google, I initially tried to like fake it till you make it. Um, so if people were talking about something I didn't understand or that I wasn't that interested in, honestly, I would pretend that I did understand. Um, because I was embarrassed to say, I have no idea what a packet is. Can you explain what that is? Um, and that went badly for me. I don't recommend that path. And what ended up working for me or being more beneficial was I read this book, Growth Mindset by Carol Dweck. Um, every, well, I feel like everybody's heard of a growth mindset at this point. I would really encourage you to read the whole book because it's fantastic. She's a really good writer. And the point of the growth mindset is sort of, you can get better at something if you work at it. And that sounds very obvious if you say it, but a lot of people you'll find sort of deeply don't believe that like, oh, I'm not a math person. Well, you could be if you worked at like understanding math better, you could become a math person. But if you say something like, I'm not a math person or I'm not one of those techie people, um, then that is the opposite of a growth mindset. That is a fixed mindset where you sort of believe that your traits are innate and they can't really be altered that much. Um, so I tried to lean into the growth mindset version of things and I tried to start forcing myself to say, oh, can you explain that? I don't understand what a packet is, um, possibly because I don't have a CS degree, ha <laughs> ha. And that was embarrassing, it felt like, each time I had to do it, but I don't think anyone else actually minded getting to explain things to me. Um, and it did make it a lot easier to actually learn the things that I needed to do my job. Um, on topic of being specifically a woman in tech, it was strange for me um, to come from book publishing, which is really dominated by women, it's like 98% women, to tech where it was a lot of men. Um, that was kind of jarring to me. There were a couple of times that I would realize I was the only woman in a room of like 70 people. 
And one thing that was really great was my tech lead on my first team at Google was a woman, is a woman, she continues to be a woman. Um, and it was terrific and was also like one of the most ambitious and like powerful people in the org, it seemed like. Um, yeah, so I, I would recommend finding a female mentor if that's something that's important to you or if you're feeling like, well, this is really male dominated space. Um, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Like someone mentioned in the chat, thank you for being honest and open about really what it was like. Um, I really do want to save time for questions at the end from the audience. So I'm going to ask one last quick question before we go into that. Can each of you share the best advice you've received in your careers? And uh, would love for you to provide a quick glimpse of the culture at your respective companies as well. Okay, all right. Uh, so I think the best advice I ever got was uh, keep learning, keep learning. You're not done when you graduate from boot camp. You're not done. You got to keep learning. Uh, and I think that was really great advice. So, and I've changed careers several times and uh, it's it's been interesting. And I have to be honest with you, my job with better help and being a technical recruiter is my favorite ever. So uh, that's been great advice because if I hadn't kept learning and kept going, I wouldn't have ever had this job and been in this place. So that's that's been great advice for me. Um, in terms of our culture at BetterHelp, I think we are um, a collaborative. We are a fast-paced startup-like culture. Uh, we have a culture of curiosity. Uh, we're also very, very supportive. I love to tell this story about my dev team, and they are my team. Um, we have grown the engineering team from 25 to over 80 um, since I've been with the company. And one of the first things I did when I started, because it was in COVID, everybody was completely remote. And I thought, wow, if I'm going to hire this team, um, how am I going to get to know them? And so I just lurked on the Slack channel. I just lurked on their Slack channel to see how they talk to one another. And I was so impressed with the way that they communicate with one another, because I literally saw someone write, hey, does anybody have time to help me test something? Um, I want to get it out on the morning train. Oh, I can help you. I can help you. I mean, fabulous. Or, hey, does anybody know, should I write this line of code or would it be better to write it this way? That's amazing. That I mean, that is such a wonderful, wonderful culture of learning, collaboration, support to come from. So that's what I think about BetterHelp. Amy, what do you think? Yeah, so um, if I had one word to sum up the culture, it would be supportive that this is, I feel like everyone wants to see everyone else succeed and it's non-judgmental. It's very, like I haven't been, I haven't worked at places where people want to see me fail, but it's like more of an attitude of don't care, or this is very nurturing here. And sorry, what was the, the oh, best piece of advice? I, um, I would say go bring your manager solutions, not problems. And I want to be really careful about saying this because you, it's okay to go to your manager with problems if you have a problem. But try to think of a solution first. And if you can come up with a solution, it's not that managers are lazy, they're just busy. And it's a great way for you to drive, like, gee, I'd really like to work on this. You know, you can drive the problem towards something that you want. That would be my advice. Gigi? I think the best piece of advice I ever got and this is not tech specific, it is just job or life specific, is that you can do anything for 25 minutes. Um, so if you Google the phrase Pomodoro timer, Pomodoro like the sauce, uh, like a kind of tomato sauce, um, you can find websites that will just do a 25 minute timer. Somehow Pomodoro timer means 25 minute timer. And people who use Pomodoros will set the timer, work for 25 minutes, and then take a five minute break and then do it again. And I have found that to be so, 
so useful, especially for starting a new project where I'm feeling daunted or overwhelmed or feeling like I don't even know where to start here. And then I'll tell myself, well, I just have to focus on it for 25 minutes right now. And that's it. And after that, I'm going to go have some chocolate. And then usually by the end of the 25 minutes, I've made a bit of a dent. And then the next time it's not as daunting to pick it back up. So I wish I had learned about the Pomodoro timer early in, earlier in my career. I only learned about it a couple of years ago. But honestly, I have it bookmarked. Bookmarked. It's my second most visited page after email. Um, I just go to this Pomodoro timer website that all it is is a 25 minute timer. And I click start. And then that is how I do my work. So big fan of the Pomodoro timer. Highly recommend. And for the culture of my team, so I work on a, my team is podcasts in YouTube, um, and we mostly work right now on YouTube music, but we're also going to be introducing podcasts to YouTube in a bigger way. Um, and my team is great. We're split between Cambridge and New York and San Bruno. I'm, I sit in Cambridge. Um, we're a fairly small team. Everybody is very into music and podcasts, so we do a lot of talking about what podcast episode we've been listening to lately. So everybody is sort of interested in the product itself that we're working on. And I would say it's also a very supportive team. We're constantly reviewing each other's code, helping each other out, teaching each other how different things in the YouTube uh, coding infrastructure work. Um, And it's also like a supportive place sort of outside of coding, sort of in life. We're sort of invested in each other's happiness and well-being in a nice way. So yeah, it's it's great. Highly recommend. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for answering everything so thoroughly. Everything was so insightful. I definitely want to leave time for questions. So if you have any questions for Julia, Amy, or Gigi, please drop it in the chat. And I will try to answer as many as possible before we hit that, um, that one hour mark in 10 minutes. Cool. Any tips on overcoming imposter syndrome? And just feel free to just one of you jump in and we can we can jump through these pretty fast. Well, I ha- can't resist saying you could talk to a better health therapist. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> <laughs> That actually sounds like a question that would be great for Hesu um, on our clinical uh, operations team. I think she would have a fabulous answer for that. And I am certainly not qualified. So I'm going to leave it to Gigi uh, to explain what she has done. (laughs) Maybe if you want to share some, or maybe not, I don't know. Sure, no, happy to. Um, So definitely recommend that book, The Growth Mindset. Um, I would also recommend just telling people, hey, I'm having a lot of imposter syndrome. You all seem brilliant and this project seems hard. How do you recommend I go about starting it? Um, Usually people find that kind of direct candor, like kind of disarming. Um, And also everyone has it. Everyone has imposter syndrome. I don't think I've met a single person in tech who hasn't talked about their imposter syndrome. And that includes people who like build computers in their basement. so yeah, talk about it, talk to a therapist. I haven't used BetterHelp, but I am a big believer in therapy um, and read the growth mindset. Love it. Any tips for extroverted Swedes? How do you bring interpersonal skills in your work? Um, and I feel like specifically as someone who is an extrovert and also had my time as a software engineer, I did also feel like I struggled with that um, too feel happy as an engineer, but then also be extroverted at work. So if you guys have any thoughts or tips on that. Sorry, I didn't see the question. Extroverted Swede, like Swedish? Swedes as software engineers. Oh, oh, oh. (laughs) well, I'm total introvert, so I have no advice. I have to say I'm also an introvert. <laughs> okay, I will give my advice as an extrovert then. Um, I, w- I would really encourage you to spend time out of your day-to-day, like getting coffee, getting lunch with other people. I honestly would spend a lot of time with other teams as well because just more people to hang out with and talk to. I actually eventually navigated into product management um, because it's generally like a much more social role, but I really found that my time as a software engineer is what made me like a really great product manager and is actually what got me 
that role. And so even spending some, if, if you're, if you're extroverted and you're not finding that a software engineering role is really doing it for you, it's still really good use of your time because it's only going to make you a better product manager if you do end up transitioning that. And I know there are other uh, jobs like consulting and stuff like that, that can still use the technical skills that you would learn in a traditional degree or a boot camp or even in a past job that you can bring to these other roles. And like Gigi said, your first job is not your perfect job. So you have to ladder into that and step into it in the future. Um, By the way, can I just say one thing real quick? Yes, please. Um, somebody pointed out in the chat, I have the name of the book wrong. It's Mindset is the name of the book. Mindset by Carol Dweck. Growth mindset is the one you want. <laughs> Perfect, love it. Um, okay, another question I found, is there a certain time in the year where we should be preparing for recruiting? And how do recruiters like hire within the seasons? Is it all year? Is it just a certain time of the year? At BetterHelp, it's really driven by the need of the team, the current needs of the team. And so it's not as seasonal, although I will say things tend to slow down a little bit towards the end of the year as the holidays come. And then most companies are gearing up, they're preparing their year end and they're um, looking at, they're doing their planning for the next year. So things kind of slow down a little bit towards the end of the year. Um, I will also say that over, over the summer, um, things tend to lengthen a little bit because so many of the people that you're going to need to interview with are out of town with their families on summer vacation. Just going to be really honest about that. So when the recruiter says, you know, it's going to be next week, uh, it really is going to be next week because that person is, is out of town. Uh, but for, for better help, it's not as seasonal maybe other companies it is but for us it's about the the needs of the team and that's when we hire we don't really we do i would say just barely in time planning so let me let me clarify that what i mean by that is when the team needs help they wait to decide do we really need help is this going to be help that we need temporarily or permanently because we don't want to have to go through layoffs we make sure that we really have the role open before we open it so what that means is the hiring managers wait until they really need help and then their hair is on fire and then they're calling me and they're saying julia i need can you find me quick <laughs> so that's kind of the way it works at better help i'm sure other larger companies uh do more planning and um and it's it's different but at better help that's the way we do it Super, super helpful. Um, another question in the chat that I think is really interesting um, from Dylan, it says, it's one thing to make yourself a top level candidate when you have abundance of time. But for those of us who are juggling a lot of responsibilities, what would you say is the single most important metric to focus on improving? Is this, this is for entry level? I would say it's like uh, transitioning into, or. Dylan, feel free to chime in, but I would imagine it's transitioning into a software engineering role. So probably. Uh, yeah, I mean, I would say completing your boot camp, uh, make sure that you're finished. I know that people want to apply before they're going to graduate, but that I I, I really need to wait to, for folks to be finished. And then um, once you've done your resume with all of the tech stack and everything delineated with each project and the thing at the top, uh, and I would say, figure out what's your five minute elevator pitch. What, tell me about you. And what I mean by that is make sure that in a very concise way in your application, when you answer your question, the questions I've got at the bottom of the application, when you put in a cover letter, um, have your personality shine through because that's what I'm looking for. And I don't think that takes extra time. I mean, my, well, it might, you might want to run it by a couple of people and see what they think when they read it, but that'd be my advice. Amy, Gigi, anything to add? Okay, cool. Well, when it came to applying for jobs and prepping for interviews, what type of balance should we strike if we're currently recruiting? So I'm sorry, prepping for interviews or what was the other? The balance between applying for jobs and uh -huh. prepping 
for interviews. Uh, we, we chatted about how it's very much a numbers game, but at the same time, you also have to practice a lot in your interviews. You know, what, what is the right balance to do that um, when we're looking for a job? I think it depends on where you are in your job search. Um, at, at some point, you know, you start off and you're just going to be applying, 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 and eventually you are going to start doing some interviews and you're going to learn with each interview. And even if you don't, if you don't get the job or you get a certain far, you know, certain length down the, the process, you'll have an initial interview with a recruiter. You'll have, I'll just run through the, at least our process, an initial interview with a recruiter. Then we have a small technical assessment. Then you have an interview with the hiring manager. Then we have a big coding challenge, which is where you meet with other folks in the team. <clears throat> and then we have a final presentation, a final panel interview. So getting your foot in the door, I think, is the most important thing. You've got to start there. So I would be focusing on getting my foot in the door because you are going to learn as you go. Um, that's where I would spend my time. Um, for me, when I was doing job hunting, I would do, I think I mentioned this before, I would spend my morning on job applications and I would spend my afternoon on uh, interview prep. And this was, again, because I was like in the privileged position of having taken unpaid time to go through the boot camp and then to apply to jobs. Um, but yeah, I would try to time box my job applications to like two hours of focused application time um, in the morning, which as Julia said, you don't need to write a super long cover letter. You shouldn't be writing a super long cover letter. Um, so you really just need like a great resume, a great portfolio, and then maybe three lines in a cover letter and then answer the questions that are in the actual application. Um, so I would time box that to like no more than two hours in the morning, but I would make sure that I got through five applications um, because that was just the number I set for myself every day. And then I would try to do one coding interview um, ideally one per afternoon, because at the time this was my sole focus. Um, once I had a tech job and I was looking to prepare for interviews to move to what ended up being Google, um, I did not have that kind of time to spend on this sort of thing. So I instead, I think I did two coding interviews per week in the evening. Um, and it, it was hard to find time for it, uh, but I do think at Google, our process is you have your application. Uh, if your application is approved by a recruiter, then you move on to a phone interview with an engineer. And if you get through that, then you move on to an on-site interview where it's five one-hour interviews back-to-back -back with different engineers. Um, and you really need your interviewing, your coding interview skills to be up to par, even for the phone interview. Um, so I just found it to be so helpful to have had so much practice talking through um, my programming choices as I was writing them out because it's not an intuitive thing to talk about why you're doing something as you're writing it out on the whiteboard. Um, so this is a bit of a jumbled answer, but I would say do both. Thank you so much. Um, really appreciate it. I, a lot of people are asking if this is going to be recorded. Yes, it's going to be recorded. It will be on both the App Academy and the Genshi YouTube, so you can definitely watch it later there. Um, we have, it's time. So I just wanted to give Julia, Amy, Gigi, like really thank you so much for your time. I, I can only imagine how helpful this it is for people at this time uh, in their job search and especially breaking into software engineering and thinking about tech careers is obviously very challenging, whether you're entry level or you're transitioning in your career. So thank you so much again. If you guys are interested in potentially being selected for one-on-one -on -one chat with Julia, make sure that you submit your resume at the link in, um, I just dropped in the chat. I'll drop it one more time. It's a bit.ly link. So make sure you drop your resume there if you're interested in getting time with Julia and um, really want to thank App Academy as well for sponsoring this event. And if you're, if you enjoyed this and if you're interested in joining more events like this in the future, feel free to follow Jen Chi for more updates about events we're going to do in the future. And I'll also drop the link for you guys to follow us as well in the chat. Cool. Well, thank you so much and have a great rest of your day. Bye. Thank you, Adney. <laughs>